he said chick will go first and then kashi and i thought oh no she's going to translate for me again up here <laughs> amen we got the uh we we was we just come back from a six week uh to, uh, deal over there because we went and seen family. She, their mom and dad had a 50th wedding anniversary, and and uh, and then uh, we got to do a, at the last couple of weeks. We got to really do a lot of good uh, missions work. It just uh, came in there, you know, and that's the way it happens, you know. So that was a that was a blessing there, you know. And and uh, I said, oh no, she's going to translate for me again oh. there, you know. Cause they didn't have anybody else in the, uh, the Nogamese church there in Demerford and. And uh, I'll, I'll get some of these places mixed up, cause you know. But uh, and sometimes I, I, the Nogamese language is is a little different as far as the regular uh, language, and it takes a lot more words. But I didn't know that, and I I would say a few words, and then she would sit there for a while, and I'd go to the bathroom and come back in, and, I, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, not really. I'm I'm joking, I'm joking. But uh, I'd sit there and I'd say, did I say that? <laughs> I said today. Say that, but it was a, it sure was a blessing. You know, I like this verse here, second, uh, First Corinthians uh, two nine, and it, and it says, it says, uh, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. How many in here love God? Amen. 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 And uh, the things done for Christ is the only things that last. And I and I think of the. I, I I think of the, when I uh, what I saw and what we saw over there. You didn't get to see, but I'm going I'm going to try to picture it to you, you know. And uh, uh, I got an opportunity to go into the the mountains into uh, a couple of churches there in the middle of nowhere. It took us two and a half hours uh, uh, to drive up there. I believe it took that long, and uh, and uh, get up there and it's a just a old fashioned church. Thank God, Amen. And uh, and uh, God gave him the privilege to preach up there, and I was sitting up in the front like this, and and I was looking. The windows was all open, and I was looking, and people was coming down here, here. These little trails I thought was cow trails or something. It was people trails. And they didn't have vehicles. I didn't see any, and uh, so they walked to church. Amen. And I said, Wait a minute. I need to pray a little bit harder here, because these people came to church. They sat in non padded pews and no air conditioning. And they came there to, 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 to praise God. Amen. No piano. They, and uh, Lord, right over here, somebody opened up a song book. Boy, they started singing. And it was our songs in their language. And it'll touch your heart. Amen. Yeah. The, the Spirit just uh, fill you up there, you know. And uh, and uh, got to see a, a few of them saved there. And, uh, boy, that was a blessing too. But, you know, I've seen hunger. Uh, have you seen people hungry for God? You know, there's people here in America too. But I've seen people hungry for the Word of God. Amen? And uh, that's the way we need to be. And uh, they they just looking for some more. You know, I don't know how much they know. I don't know very much. Uh, but, you know, they just looking for more. And there's there's uh, opportunity after opportunity there, you know. And uh, I, I looked towards the college. And uh, there was, uh, I, I think, is there about 70 students there or something? And just to watch their eyes as you're up there, you know talking to them they're just yeah. like you know they're just wanting to, wanting to know something but you know what if you can plant something in those they might go out there and be a pastor one day they might be a missionary they might be a missionary coming here or something you know and uh, uh there's just something to that you know and uh uh there's it's just poverty more poverty as you know probably but uh you know lots of traffic and stuff you know you go down in there and it's kind of crazy i got the privilege of driving there this time and that, <laughs> that, that word faith amen i mean amen to that I'd, I'd be right like this here and somebody just right right there on my elbow i ain't kidding you know i just hand them a track there you know <laughs> but speaking of tracks I, i've been there a couple times I went there in 206 and 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 uh, uh brother elvis and him and met her and my wife amen to that and uh uh, you know, that's what I came here. I mean, I'll be honest with you. That's that's what I came here for. I ain't going to lie to you like a bunch of people. I, I, I went up there to missions work. That was my mission right there. Amen. <laughs> but, the, but the next time we came together, two years of being married, 2-6 two to 2-12. Two that's two twelve. Six years later. And still, I don't believe I had the opportunity to do this, to hand out tracts. And, and even in, the, I, I don't know why, but that's just something... 
And, and in the next, this, this time here, 14, we came and we was going to, we made tracks and gave them out. I don't know what happened, you know. We didn't have no, I mean, two of the people making the tracks got saved. Amen to that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, and then a little three-year-old Kazia was there handing people tracks out there in the middle of the city, you know, there to town. And the people would take them and read them. I wonder how many of them got saved. How many of them understood it? Amen. I read it, you know. You got to hand them out. Amen. And and to see to see that, you know. But when Kazia, when we first got there, boy, I mean, uh, 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 by the way, Brother Shannon or, or Kashi's sister will be here Friday. Amen. It's been two years, two years her trying to get here, and she'll be here Friday. Amen. Amen, Amen to that. And uh, that's that's been a long time coming. And and. Uh, Oh, Shannon, he's uh, he's really blossomed up now, boy. He's on the stove. He used to come over every day, and he, I don't even see him no more now. You know, <laughs> but uh, got sidetracked there. But I was I was I was thinking, you know, <laughs> but I was I was I was thinking about about those souls and stuff. And oh, whenever we first got there, you know, it was a big shock to see it. You know, I mean, we'd done. Of course, Kashi's from there, and I and it was a big shock to me when I first came there, and you know, to see the. Uh, the lighter complexion, you know, and all that, and or darker, yeah. And uh, but <laughs> but she but she really took up to Kashi's mom and dad there, and and uh, I mean just gave them a big hug. But after that, it's just kind of like, where am I? You know, I mean, where am I? But after a month of being there, here comes Brother Paul Place and Miss D and Miss Kim there, and Kazia comes out there, and she just she looks at them like, what are they doing here? You know, different different, you know. And and I thought that was a blessing too. But but it it was, you know, and and. Uh, uh, like I say, I've I seen something. There's a there's an orphanage. Y'all probably don't know all this stuff, but we got to spend time with those orphan kids, and and then uh, that's that's about it, there, brother. I got that right there. Thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, there's nothing quite like being there yourself. The next best thing is talking to somebody that has been there, and uh, it'll touch your heart, won't it? It'll make you different, and I appreciate that. Thank you for that testimony. And thank you for the song, Miss Kashi. Well, the ushers come, and we're going to receive an offering tonight. And uh, this will be a love offering to uh, help cover uh, expenses, our speaker, and so forth. And so if you'll give as God has enabled you, we appreciate it. Brother, uh, Brother Denny, would you pray and ask the Lord's blessing? Amen. Thank you. say thanks for being here to everybody that's uh, come tonight. We want to recognize our visitors. But it's great. All of you that's from Cornerstone, would you just lift your hand so everybody can see you, man? That's great. You're, you're doing a great job. We appreciate y'all driving all the way down here. Thank you, uh, Brother McMorris, for bringing them. I appreciate that. And uh, then we've got uh, folks from uh, the college down at BB. Y'all raise your hand back there. Good to have y'all. And uh, let's see, we've got Pat Tice and Jerry McEwen. Y'all wave at us back there. Uh, you work with uh, Brother Denny, and Brother Denny invited her to come, and we appreciate them being here. Thank you for coming. Now, have we missed anybody that's first time here? Good to have Bruce back with us tonight. He, his first time was last night, and he's back with us tonight. Thank you for coming. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? All right.
we appreciate Brother Al, uh, he's one of our regulars, but we appreciate him. We were having a, a supper, uh, international supper, and he got here a little late, but he did bring an exotic dish with him. Uh, he held it up. It was, uh, it was from South America. It was yellow and long tubular. Well, it, they were bananas is what they were. <laughs> and, and he <laughs> we're glad. <laughs> we got a bunch of nuts around here. We, we kind of like them. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. We're... Uh, we're down to the last song, I guess, and then Brother Sneathern's going to preach. Everybody knows Brother Sneathern here, I think. Maybe a few of our visitors don't. Brother Elvis Sneathern is going to bring the message tonight after uh, Aaron and Erica sing. And uh, Brother Sneathern was the pastor of the church that I got saved in. My wife got saved about three years before I did, and uh, and she would invite me to go to church once in a while, and I usually said no. And uh, and he'd witness to me a time or two. And whenever he could catch up with me, I tried to hide from him as much as possible. And, uh, and I finally went to church one Sunday, and, and he preached. I, I remember the text. He preached on, uh, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And he preached about uh, the flood and how that those who didn't get on the ark were left behind to perish. And uh, he said it's going to be that way again. Jesus is coming back one of these days. Amen. And if you're not saved, you'll be uh, left behind to perish. And I thought, that doesn't sound good. And... Uh, I went forward that morning and received Christ as my Savior, and uh, I've been on both sides of the fence now, and I like it a lot better on this side. Thank God for being saved. Thank God for a man like Brother Sneathen that keeps on preaching. Brother Aaron and Miss Erica is going to sing, and Brother Sneathen, you come and preach. High upon a mountain, from where he ascended, an angel of the Lord declared that it would be. He said, don't stand here grieving for the one that you see leaving in like man. soon see his appearing and this could be the hour yes this could be the day when the saints from every nation will lose their gravitation in the
Bible said he said that he would, and I believe that. Thank you for that special. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you being here, uh, you regular folks and the irregular folks, too. I'm glad for you all here. I'm, I'm glad for all of you to be here, and I'm glad that uh, for the opportunity to be here, and I'm, I appreciate Brother Brian and the folks from Cornerstone coming down. Brother Brian and Miss Donna have been good to me and my wife, and I appreciate it, and uh, I'm thankful for them, thankful to see all of y'all here. I uh, appreciated Chick's testimony, and uh, I did. He mentioned that I, I introduced him to Kashi, and uh, the first time I ever went to Northeast India, to Nagaland, I met Kashi, and uh, I was impressed by her good Christian spirit. And so I came back home, and I told Chick about her, and, and then Chick did get interested in missions. The missions are going to meet her. And uh, so I introduced them. So it worked out that sometime later they got married. And so I figured uh, this ought to be profitable to me. And uh, she's made him a good wife. So I started, after they got married, I met with Chick, and I told him, I introduced you all you have a good wife now because of me. So you ought to pay me $100 a month commission. <laughs> and so he started paying me $100 a month, and I thought, you know, man, I can just, you know, I can, I can meet these uh, good Christian uh, Asian ladies over there, and me in here, I can tell, this could be profitable. So it went on, and he was paying me $100 a month. And then after about a year, she started charging me $200 to live with him. <laughs> Now, that's not true. I'm joking, okay? Uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, I believe Chick's making her a good husband, and she's making him a good wife. And I, uh, I know Brother Brian is glad to be their pastor, and I was glad to be their pastor for several years. And, uh, but I do appreciate you folks. And ladies, y'all did a great job uh, cooking. I ate several different uh, things, and it was all good, and uh, I appreciate it very much. I mentioned last night that Brother Brooks, I love Brother Brooks, and I was talking about that we're all somewhat different but we have some things in common if we know the Lord. And so Brother Brooks and I have been good friends for a long time, but I also told you that your pastor, Brother Brooks, thinks he can cook. <laughs> and so tonight before uh, we started eating, Brother Brooks gave instruction. He said, now there's, I don't know, there's Asian food, there's German food, and there's African food, and there's uh, Mexican food. And he said, now some of you, I need to tell you that how that you eat this, you know, certain things go with other things, and he went on and told about that, and I was sitting there, and he'd already, he had baked some bread today, and when I came in, he wanted me to try a piece of that bread, and so I did, and I was thinking as I was sitting there, and he was giving instruction to people how to eat the different things, I thought, when he brings his bread around, here's the way to eat it, take a piece, smell of it, throw it in the trash, that's the way to <laughs> <laughs> now don't feel sorry for him because he'll get back with he'll get even with me okay uh, but I, I appreciate it. I, I, I believe the scripture says that a, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine and I believe that I, I like to laugh you folks are a good, uh, good bunch of people I appreciate uh, your faithfulness to come here and, and be a part of this mission conference and we talk about missions and I, I'm not going to necessarily talk about money tonight but uh, missions does involve money and I know y'all are uh, have been challenged to, you know, make faith promise commitments, and I believe y'all take those up tonight, and I think he's going to uh, maybe announce next Sunday uh, how that went and so forth. But uh, I, I, this is a story I heard about uh, about stewardship a long, a long time ago, and you probably heard it, but I'm going to tell it again because I laugh every time I tell it, so maybe you will, all right? Uh, but I heard about a family, and uh, uh, the father of the family, which was kind of an older man, inherited a million dollars. They found out that he'd inherited a million dollars, but he had not been informed. They, you know, they got the mail first and found out that he had inherited a million dollars. And so uh, then uh, so the family got real concerned because the father had a heart condition. And so they thought if we tell him that he's inherited a million dollars, he may die of a heart attack. It might excite him so that he'd just fall over dead of a heart attack. So they got to talking about how we, can we tell uh, dad that, that he's inherited a million dollars without endangering his life and so uh, uh, 
somebody said, well, why don't we talk to the pastor? He's a, he's a man of wisdom. He could probably help us. And so they called the pastor, and the pastor came over and sat down with them and told them the situation uh, that we found out they had inherited a million dollars, but we're afraid to tell him, afraid that it'll excite him so much he'll have a heart attack. And so the pastor said, well, so I think that I can help you all. He said, I'll use psychology, and I'll tell him that he's inherited a million dollars. And they said, well, we sure appreciate that, pastor. So the pastor went over uh, to the father's house, and he went over there, and the man invited him in. He sat down talking with him a little bit, and they visited a little while, and he said, say, he said, uh, what would you do if you inherited a million dollars? And he said, I'd give half of it to the church. And the preacher fell over dead with a heart attack. <laughs> I like that, amen. <laughs> but if you give a million dollars, I believe Brother brother, uh, brother Rick can handle it, all right? I believe you'll be all right. Take your Bibles tonight, and if you will, and go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 1. And if you're able to stand, let's stand in reverence to the Word of God. We'll read down through verse 8. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion or after his death by many infallible or undeniable proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me for John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence when they therefore were come together they asked of him saying Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for everyone that is in this place tonight. And Lord, there are a few things that we do know and that we know that all of us have needs. Lord, we may have different needs, but we all have needs. There may be those here tonight that have the need of salvation. Maybe they don't have the assurance that if they were to die, that they have your promise of everlasting life in heaven. If that be the case, I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would convict them, and I pray they'd be saved tonight. Lord, there may be those here tonight that are confused. I pray you'd clear up confusion. There may be those here that are discouraged. I pray, Father, you'd encourage their heart. And, Lord, there may be those that are uh, having problems with uh, temptations. And, Lord, they need strength tonight. Lord, whatever the need is, you know it. And I pray you'd meet it. I pray, Father, that as the Word of God is proclaimed tonight, that Jesus Christ would be lifted up that your Holy Spirit might work and speak to every heart and you might accomplish exactly what you'd have accomplished and we promise to give you praise for all that is accomplished. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And let me say, first of all tonight, we talk about missions and as believers, everybody that is a born-again believer, a child of God, someone who is saved, uh, well then God commands us. He gives us certain commands and principles that he wants us to practice. Now, when we talk about believers, a lot of people today think, well, uh, just about everybody in America believes in God, and that may be true, but the Bible says that the devil or the demons actually believe in God and tremble. So believe in God, in God does not, that's a good thing, but that does not make you a born-again child of God on your way to heaven. And so there's a lot of people that think that because they have joined a church or maybe they've been baptized or maybe they have uh, turned over a new leaf in their life, maybe they have uh, uh, improved some things in their life, they think, well, I'm as good as the preacher down at the church or I'm good at the deacon at the church and uh, uh, so I'll be all right because I do some good things. Now, you ought to do good things, but the truth is 
Salvation is not by comparing ourselves to someone else. Our salvation, the start, the thing that helps you with this, uh, understand salvation more than anything else, you compare yourself to me and you will find that I have weaknesses. You may be a better person than I am. That doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. You may be better than Brother Brooks. I think I'm a lot better than Brother Brooks, but I'm joking, okay? You may be better than the pastor or uh, the leaders of the church, but the truth is when you compare yourself to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was the perfect, sinless, born, incarnate Son of God. He never sinned one time. And when I compare myself to Jesus Christ, I realize that I am a sinner. I am a sinner and I needed a Savior. And so I had a time in my life where I confessed that I could not earn my way to heaven. And I humbled myself before God and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And the Word of God promised that when I do that, when I believe on Him, when I call on Him from my heart, that He would save me. And I did that when I was 24 years old and I've been saved ever since. Do you know that the Bible teaches us that you can determine, you can, it, it does not teach me to go down here and look at TJ and say, well, I think he's saved or I think he's not saved. Or look at Bub and say, well, yeah, I, 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 Bub did a, he did some things that wasn't right. Uh, he's not, God never tells me to look at them and say, he's saved or he's not saved. But he tells me to examine myself. And you know how we examine ourselves? By the scripture. Romans 8, 16 says his spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know how I know I'm saved? I can, now, I joke around, harass people. Brother Rick and I insult each other all the time, but we have fun, okay? He don't mean it, and I'm only about half serious when I insult him, okay? <laughs> but we joke around, okay? I, I Christians ought to have fun, okay? But if I said something to you that was hurtful, something that, that I should not say, I know that I'm saved because when I say that to you, by the time I make it to the back door, I might feel pretty good when I say it, but the time I make it to the back door, the Holy Spirit of God is going to say, you dummy, what in the world have you done? And I'm going to feel horrible until I come back to you and I say, will you please forgive me until I tell God and ask God to forgive me. Now, John chapter 10, verse 27, 28. Jesus says, my sheep, those that are saved, hear my voice. I know I'm saved because God speaks to me. Now you just say, <laughs> I love this. You say, hey, does he speak to you audibly? It's louder than that. But if you're saved, I guarantee you, he says, my sheep hear my voice. I can do wrong and he speaks to me. I'll do right, and he speaks to me. When he's wanting me to do something that I have not considered and may not want to do, he speaks to me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. He knows us. He knows our heart. He knows what we're real or whether we fake. And I know them, and now listen to this, and they follow me. Now, he didn't say everybody follows me perfectly. In fact, the Bible will tell you that if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us, First John. But let me tell you this. When I got saved, God did something in my heart. He put His Holy Spirit in my heart, and I have been far from perfect and am still far from perfect. i got a long way to go. I'll not be perfect until I get to heaven. But I'm going to tell you something. God changed something, and I had a desire. I didn't like church. I didn't like preachers. I didn't like Christians. But this is my crowd now. Amen. It is my crowd. And so I want you to know something, that when we get saved, when we trust the Lord as our Savior, it's not about uh, uh, how good you are, but it's how good He was. And when we put our faith and trust in the perfect Son of God, He saves our soul. Amen. And by the way, He does it eternally. You say, well, if I believe that, i just get saved and go out and live like the devil. You'd get a whipping like the devil needs to. You said, I thought you said God loves you. He does. By the way, if you love your children, you'll discipline them when they need it. That's what the Bible says. If you spare the rod, you hate your son. 
If you love your children, you will correct them the way the Bible says when they need to. And by the way, God loves us, and when we rebel against God and we ignore God, if we are His child, if we are saved, don't think we'll get by with it. We're going to heaven. It's that settled. But I'm going to tell you something. It sure won't be fun on the way because God knows exactly how to get our attention. Amen? Now then, having said that, when we have been saved, when we are born again, then God gives us principles to live by and promises to look forward to. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. That's what World Missions is all about. Every World Missions connects to this book in every way. This book is all about World Mission. It's about telling those here in Searcy, Arkansas, in the surrounding areas, all the way over to Nagaland and all the way down to Africa, wherever there's people, God wants His people to share the good news, spread the gospel and the word of God. So, I want us to look at some things. Since God has commanded us to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world, we're to be witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world, here, there, and everywhere. Since He has commanded us to do that, God never commands us to do something that He does not enable us to do. So as we go, we need to understand that we do not go out to do that job empty-handed. First of all, let me say, and I'm going to give you several things here, but first of all, let me say, when we go out to do that job, we go out with proof that Jesus is the living Savior and that the Bible is the living Word of God. We live in a day where there's such an attack upon the Bible. I mean, ever, it's made fun of, and it is uh, people, the, the, uh, our, our governments are passing laws. Uh, for example, uh, you're in danger if publicly you discipline. I'm not talking about, don't leave here tonight thinking uh, that you ought to uh, uh, go home and beat up on your children. Uh, they may need it. Uh, and, and by the way, and I believe in discipline. Uh, but I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about child abuse here. You understand? There's a right way, a loving way to discipline a child when they need it. Now, if you're one of the, and I don't want to offend you tonight, but if you're one of those people that you say, well, I'll tell you what, my child just never needed one. You probably do. <laughs> you're the one who probably needs it. Amen? Uh, but, but we live in a day where literally laws are being passed that keeps us from, uh, be, we're in danger when we practice biblical principles. Uh, I mean, you go to Walmart and your child knock everything off the shelf and you spat him on the leg and somebody will call the, uh, the, the authorities and they'll come and arrest you. I love this story I'm going to tell. I, he's just my kind of guy. There was a guy that I know and he's just a rough old country boy, good guy. He's a saved man. Uh, he didn't always like me. He didn't always act saved. But one time his, uh, he had a sister and his sister, I don't know whether she was divorced from her husband or her husband uh, had died or what, but she had a teenage boy about 14 years old. And uh, they, they lived in my area. And, and so uh, they, uh, uh, this boy was just giving his mother all kinds of trouble. I mean, he just talked back to her and threatened to hit her and, and he just ignored her. So she went to her brother and said, I need some help. And he said, what kind of help you need? And he said, uh, well, my son said that he, is, he, he won't mind me. He's ignoring me. He's talking back to me. He's threatening to hit me and all that kind of thing. And said, uh, I can't whip him. He said, he needs a whipping. He said, well, I'll take care of it. So he was downtown a few days later, and the boy was there. And he said, hey, you want to ride out to the farm with me? And he said, yeah. So he got him in the truck, and he took him out to the farm and gave him a whipping, which is what he needed. The boy went to school the next Monday morning and told his teachers, and so the authorities came out there. He knew the county sheriff, but this woman came out there with the, who was in charge of DHS. She came out there, and uh, she told him how that, that he wasn't supposed to touch that boy, and that if he did that again, he's going to go to jail. And so she said her say, and she walked on over towards the car. He knew the county sheriff. And he said uh, to the sheriff, he said, would you do me a favor? He said, yeah. He said, 
would you tell that little woman over there in the car when y'all go back that if she ever comes out here and sticks her nose in my family again, what my nephew got ain't nothing like what she's going to get. <laughs> now you say, preacher, he'd have went to jail. I know the guy, and he'd have been glad to go to jail. He'd be, that's a little bit extreme, but let me tell you something. That we are losing our rights. Now, but with the Bible, we go out. It's the word of God. It's the principles we're to live by. But when we go out, we go out with proof that the Bible is the Word of God. Now I'm going to give you several things very quickly here. You may want to write them down. You're not going to have time to turn them all. But let me say, turn to them all. But we live in a day where people say, Oh, I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But then you quote a scripture to them. I don't believe that. You can't separate Jesus from the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, capital letter. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down in verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ. You can't separate Jesus from the word. He is the living word. He is the living Savior. And so the word of God is right. So we go out with proof that Jesus is the living Savior and that we have the living word of God. Look at verse 3 here. He said, to whom also, talking about Jesus Christ, he showed himself alive after his passion or after death by many infallible proofs. That means undeniable, unquestionable truth. Many infallible proofs. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. After his resurrection, his disciples ate with him. They fellowshiped with him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6, the Bible says he was seen of over 500 at one time. We have evidence. We have evidence. The tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. John chapter 20 and verse 1, we find that Mary went to the tomb and the stone had been rolled away and he was gone and she took off running. Now listen, she was confused about some things. She thought somebody stole the body and so she went and told Peter and John and they began to run. Now there's a message there, Brother Brian, in that. She was even confused. I'm not confused. I know he arose. I know that he ascended into heaven. I know he lives today and makes intercession for me. And I want to tell you something. We ought to be running with the gospel as fast as we can go. But they went in and then they found out that, listen, they went there and the napkin had been folded. And the, and the unbelievers say, well, now that was just, uh, he wasn't really dead. Do you know that the Roman law was such that before you buried anybody, they had uh, a, a, a particular people that verified that they were dead before they could be buried. He was dead, but he rose again three days later. You say, I don't understand that. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of things I don't understand. I don't even understand electricity, but I still flip the light switch on, Amen. Well, I don't believe anything I can't understand. Well, you're not going to believe much. I get on airplanes and fly halfway around the world, and I'm telling you how they get a 747 off the ground, and it goes through the air at 600 miles an hour. I have no idea. I can't even fly a kite very well. But, boy, they get to, it's like a hotel. I mean, some of those things seat 550 people, and, and uh, loaded down with all that stuff, all that, zoom. Boy, I'm, I'm telling you, it's in the air. I'm glad some people just believed it could be done even though they couldn't figure it out. Yeah. But I'm telling you, I believe God, uh, he can do anything, and I believe that we serve the risen Savior. Amen. There's a lot of things. When we, we see the empty tomb, there's also evidence uh, the change in the disciples from tipping uh, to bold witnesses. Now, I told you, I think I mentioned Peter earlier. But Peter denied Christ when they said he'd one of his. Uh, no, no, I, but he denied Christ. But I want to tell you something. After the Holy Spirit came to indwell them on the day of Pentecost, he was the first one that stood up and preached to that multitude, and God used him. In Acts 17, uh, chapter 60, uh, we, we find, excuse me, 17, factor, chapter 6, I guess it is, we find that they were accused of turning the world upside down. Those disciples were. They were timid, but... When the Spirit of God came in, they've turned the world upside down. We meet on Sunday. We were here last Sunday meeting. 
You know why we do? In celebration of the resurrection, Jesus arose from the grave on Sunday morning to change lives of believers that you and I have known. We look at the Bible and we find Saul, who was persecuting Christians, was changed and became one of the best servants of God that ever lived. He wrote more of the epistles in the New Testament than anybody else. I go back, your pastor, your pastor, the change in his life. He told you, and I told you the story about he wouldn't expect me, he run for me, he wouldn't expect me, and I was teaching all the class on Sunday morning. He knew he was safe, his wife and kids. By the way, uh, Karen, I, uh, she may be in a nursery, but I appreciate her being faithful. There you are over there. You're the blonde-headed lady. Uh, but anyway, she was faithful, and she brought those kids to church, and she prayed for her husband. But, but let me tell you something. Other people were praying too. But I went over there that Sunday morning. He thought he was saved because he knew I taught Sunday school from 10 to 11 o'clock. And I went over there and knocked on the door. And he opened the door. And I had called him. I talked to him about the Lord. Didn't force anything on him. He did not get saved. But a couple of weeks later, he came and got saved. Now, we're talking about changed lives. You know what he did the very Sunday that he walked the aisle and got saved? You know what he did? I hate to tell so much about your pastor. He used to make home brew. Y'all know what home brew is? Don't tell off on yourself now. Be careful here. <laughs> he used to make wine. <laughs> Several of his old buddies in Mount Pleasant said his wine's a whole lot better than his bread is. <laughs> he went home that Sunday and he took the liquor in his house and poured it down the drain. I remember it so well because the deacons of the church got mad because he didn't share it with them. But anyway, I'm joking about that, okay? But he poured it down the drain. You say, preacher, that's changed. That's what happened. He didn't need that stuff anymore. That's changed. So change lives. I think about the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man needs to be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. I think about Sonny James, who's with the Lord now. Big guy, about 6'5", and weigh about 300 pounds, and uh, auctioneer. And Sonny got saved. God got a hold of his heart. Sonny and Melba got saved, and I preached both of their funerals just in the last few years here. And they got saved, and Sonny's a big old auctioneer and good night. Now, could, can you believe this? People come into a church, and the pastor's name is Elvis, and he became song leader. The song leader's name was Sonny James. They were famous people in that church, amen. <laughs> but he became the song leader. Now, Sonny was like me. Now, folks, let me tell you something about Aaron. When he gets up here and does this kind, he don't know what he's doing. Here, here's all you got to do. Here's all you got to do. If you don't know how to lead singing, if you just got a little bit of, of rhythm, just get up here and spell your name. Nobody, ever, most people never know the difference, okay? Now, I don't know about Aaron. I ain't kidding about that. But Sonny, he, never, he couldn't spell, I don't guess. <laughs> but Sonny, big guy, I mean, his hands were big, and he'd get up there and he'd say, let's turn to such and such, and here's the way he'd lead singing. He'd double up that fist and just like that. But boy, people would sing, I'm telling you. They were afraid not to sing. But all I'm saying is the change, the change in his life. And so we, uh, hey, God is real. The Word is the living Word of God. Somebody moved in when I got saved, and if you're saved, somebody moved in. You say, how do you know he's there? Because I talk to him on a regular basis, and he talks to me. John chapter 14 and verse 20 said, At that day, talking about the day of Pentecost, ye shall know ye are in me, and I am in you. And let me tell you something. When you get saved, he comes in, and he's there. And you will know it. Now, you, hey, you say, well, preacher, can you ever doubt? Sure, the devil can plant the doubts in your mind. But the way you examine your salvation is by the Scripture. And so there's many things. We go on and we can look at some things. Christ's birth in Isaiah 9 6, it says, Unto us a child is born. His birth was prophesied. Christ's death and resurrection in Luke chapter 18 33, it says, They shall scourge him and put him to death, but on the third day, he shall rise again. We see in the New Testament uh, prophecies that have been prophesied before, we see them being fulfilled. Uh, we see in the Old Testament, we see the Jews returning to Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3 through 5, it teaches us that 
God will gather the Jews from all the nations they have been scattered to back to Israel. In 1948, Israel became a nation. You know, I was uh, reading something, a, a book about Israel. And the people who live in Israel, uh, every night they're surrounded by Arab Muslim nations that hate them that would like to see the Jews wiped off the face of the earth now that's a fact if you watch the news you'll figure that out okay and they're surrounded by them Israel is a very very small country but you know when I look at the scripture and I was reading that book and the thought came to my mind for, since for years now the Jews who live in America and other places that are relatively safe are going back to Israel and when they go back to Israel and live in Israel, every time they go to the market, they're in danger of a suicide bomber. Every time their wife or their children get on a bus, their children go to school, they're in danger of a suicide bomber. When they lay down to go to sleep at night, they're in danger of a missile being fired from their close neighbors that hate them and blowing their house up. Why would they go back there? because God said they would and they have been going back they became a nation in 1948 and so God's prophecies are still being fulfilled today Isaiah chapter 41 verse 12 through 14 uh, we find there that it said that Israel would prevail over their enemies in uh, 1967 Israel fought with several of its nations it fought against Egypt United Arab Republic, Jordan, Syria, several of them, all the military experts of that day said there is no way it's impossible for Israel to win this war. Not only did they defeat all of that bunch that was coming against them, they defeated them in six days. It's known as the Six-Day War. Do you know that Israel can get a fighter jet in the air quicker than any other nation on the face of the earth. Now God says that they'll prevail over their enemy. There's so many things we could talk about here. Uh, the scripture talks about in Amos chapter 9 verse 11 and verse 13. It talks about the ruins of Israel being rebuilt and barren lands becoming productive. You know that, that the barren desert lands of Israel because of their wisdom in irrigation techniques do you know that they are producing food not only for their own country, but they are producing food for several surrounding countries? The Bible is true. It's been fulfilled. You say, well, that's the Bible uh, that is, is being fulfilled, and much of that you see it fulfilled in the Bible, but a lot of it you can see in the latter days. But let me tell you one right now, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also that in the last day, perilous, troublesome times shall come for because men shall be lovers of their own self. And it goes on and says, disobedient to parents. I wonder how that got in there. Does that fit our day? Absolutely. It does. Several things, and I won't take time to go through them all. Down in verse 7 you'll find ever learning. We've got people that I mean Good night. We've got technology. There's such an emphasis put on education. I'm not anti-education, but there's such a, uh, you know, we're impressed. Many, many people in Baptist churches. Can I just work on the Baptist? We won't have time to get to anybody else, okay? But there's people in Baptist churches today, and because somebody's got a bunch of degrees behind their name, they'll run out some garbage that is contrary to the Word of God, and people, well, but, but he's a doctor. He's a, oh, he's got these degrees. He, he's a doctor of psychology or, or he's a doctor of this or a doctor of that or he's a doctor of something else. Let me tell you something. God, the author of this book, created the mind of the smartest people in earth. Amen. And he understands them. And we're foolish. By the way, let's talk about doctors a little bit. I am a doctor. Are y'all impressed? I have a doctorate. 
is called a doctor of humanities. And Brother Rick has one, a doctor of divinity. Is yours divinity or humanity? He's a doctor. He knows how to make candy. Okay? I'm going to make a point here, okay? I'm trying to impress y'all with Brother Rick and I, okay? I'm going to make a point. How many of y'all know who Lester Roloff was? Old-time preacher. I had the privilege of getting here and preach several times. Down in Texas, he had the children's homes. He took kids off the street all messed up, and boy, he took them in and helped them. And, and, uh, but he used biblical principles. When they got out of line, he paddled them and uh, loved them and fed them and all of that kind of stuff. And man, I'm telling you, he was, he was just, but he was, he had, he was just an old country boy. When he went to Baylor University, they tell me that he took a milk cow with him way back there and milked that cow to pay his way through college. But he was a brilliant man. He had several degrees, actual earned degrees. Mine is an honorary, and his is an honorary. But he got killed in a plane crash. And they tell me that when they went to that wreckage of that plane and found Lester Roloff, Lester Roloff no doubt had many doctor's degrees, honorary and otherwise probably. But when they found Lester Roloff, he had his old King James Bible like this, pressed against his heart, he was not holding his doctorate degree. And I'm not going to hold mine, and he's not going to hold his. Ours is honorary. Yours is honorary, isn't it? Mine's honorary, too. You know what that means? We're smart enough to make people who have colleges think we know what we're doing. That's it, ain't it, brother? <laughs> now, I don't want to be insulting. I appreciate the college that bestowed that upon me, and I know Brother Rick does too. But actually what it means is this. They believe that through practical uh, living and uh, studying the Word of God, they believe that their college wanted to bestow that. I only use that so you'd know that when you get ready to go home to be with the Lord, He's not going to be impressed with your doctorate degrees. Or your mat. Now, nothing wrong with that. Hey, if you earn one, let me tell you, it took work, and I'm proud of you, okay? The point I'm not trying to make is not against education. The point I'm trying to make is don't become an educated ignoramus like it talks about in verse 7, where that they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you learn something that's contrary to this book, then you kick it out and stay with this book, and you'll be smart. You'll be smart to do that. Now then, I didn't mean to take so much time on that, but in another hour and a half we'll be done. So y'all just bear with me, okay? I'm joking, okay? It won't be long, all right? <clears throat> when we go out, we don't go out alone. We don't go out empty-handed. We go out with proof. Jesus Christ is the living Savior, and we go out with the living Word of God. And there's a second thing we go out with. We go out with power. I cannot carry out what God wants me to do in my own strength, nor can you. Now look at verse 8. He says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and indwells us. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. He had told them, don't go till you receive the promise, which was the promise of the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49, he had told them, Jesus told them to tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Now I want you to think with me just a moment about this thing of power. God indwells us with his Holy Spirit. We have Holy Spirit power, and when we proclaim the gospel and the word of God, and we pray and ask God to use us, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. When Rick Brooks got saved, I went over to his house and witnessed to him. And he came to church. But here's why he got saved. He was hearing the gospel, but his wife and men and people in the church were praying that he would get saved. We were also praying for Gary Sims. 
and we get we had two men. We gave names of men in the community, and two men prayed daily for those men, and we tried to go witness to them, and we had person after person after person get saved, and literally the little community of Mount Pleasant, Arkansas, was turned upside down for Jesus Christ. And most of those people are serving the Lord today. That's what we're supposed to do, but we can't do it in our own power. We cannot do it. But when we proclaim the gospel and the word of God, you see some people get saved. You see some good things happen. But we also not only go out with proof that Jesus is the living Son of God and the word of God is the living word of God and with power of the Holy Spirit, but we go out with promises. Boy, I like the promises of Almighty God. I thank God for them. We can count on God's promise. We read there in, in verse 4, it said, Don't depart until you wait for the promise of the Father. What was that promise? That they were going to be endued with power from on high. God kept his promise to them, and God keeps his promise to us. We got the promise of salvation. If you'll call it, he said, if you look at Romans chapter 10, if you call, verse 10 and 11 through 13 there, you'll find out that if from our heart we call on the Lord, he will save us. Now let me stop here just a minute. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word saved in the original language is sozo, S-O-Z-O, which means to keep safe and sound. When you get saved, God does the keeping. You've heard anybody say, well, I'm just holding on to God. Let me tell you something, I'll slip. But God got me in his hand. And he's holding on to me, and according to John chapter 10, nothing can pluck us out of his hand. And so uh, we have got promise after promise about salvation. By the way, we also have promise that if we'll live according to his principles as best we can, that we'll have a fruitful life. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Uh, we've got promise after promise after promise. We are promised in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58, we're promised victory over death. Victory over death. I, my wife, I do have a wife, and uh, maybe she'll be here tomorrow night. She, she got home a couple hours after I left this afternoon. She's been in Fort Smith. Her brother has pancreatic cancer, and uh, while she was there, uh, her uh, sister-in-law was put in the hospital and, and pneumonia. Uh, she's uh, on a uh, uh, breathing machine all that. We don't know whether she's going to live, and, and she called me this morning and said uh, the sons had said something about uh, that they wanted me to preach the funeral. And uh, I'm always, I, while I don't like to see people die, but I'm always an honor when people ask me to preach a funeral. But now, folks, let me tell you something. The hardest thing a preacher ever does is to stand before a family and try to comfort them when that person has never received Christ as Savior and never told anybody that he did. Because there is no comfort. Now, I've had people ask me when I preach funeral, people who don't know any better will say foolish things sometimes. I've come back from funerals before and people say, Preacher, did you preach them into heaven or preach them into hell? No preacher can preach anybody into heaven or anybody into hell. Your eternal destiny depends upon what we do with Jesus Christ. The only thing we can do is deliver the message. God loves you. He proved it by giving his son to die for you. And his son, what he did on the cross, satisfied the sin payment for the whole world and it applies to us when we humble ourselves and believe on him so we have promise after promise about salvation we have promise that if we're saved we're going to be a part folks of a rapture or a resurrection one or the other people say well I, I hope I make the rapture well, I'd like to never have to go to the grave, but if I go to the grave, I'm still going to be in the rapture because I'm going to just, I, I, I don't know all the details about it, but the dead in Christ, the resurrection is going to take first. And just in the twinkling of an eye, that's pretty quick, uh, then uh, uh, the 
saved of earth are going to be raptured. So we're probably going to all go up together. Some just got six foot further to go. Amen? So we're all going to be in that great reunion. Now I'm glad. I'm glad about that reunion. Because I, I know I give Brother Brooks a hard time. But seriously speaking, I know because of the blood of Christ and his faith in Christ and my faith in Christ. If we, if I lived here tonight and never saw him again this way, I'm going to see him again. Amen. I'm encouraged by that because I'm going to harass him in heaven. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I want to see him in heaven. I want to see you folks in heaven. If we go to India and the Philippines. we got friends over there. Let me tell you something. There's people in India and the Philippines that I'm going to see in heaven one of these days. Because we've got a promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when we're saved, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent for the believer, absent from the body, present with the Lord, which is far better. We have a good time in church. Man, we come and we fellowship always better with food. Amen. We laugh, we sing, we eat, we have a good time. But could I say this to you? Excuse my English. Remember, I'm a doctor. You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay? You ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you, folks, for listening. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I want you to think with me just a moment. If you're here tonight and you do not know that you've humbled yourself and you've put what faith you have in Jesus Christ and Him alone, that's the only way of salvation. And the only way that you're going to have assurance and peace is to claim the precious promises of the Word of God that he'll keep you safe and sound. He said that he'll in no wise cast us out. If you're not saved today, if you don't have assurance tonight, I want you to have that. I want you to have the peace that I have to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, if you're here tonight as a Christian and maybe you're going through a battle, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell Brother Brooks unless you want to, unless we can help you, we'll be glad to. But if you need to come to an altar, you do so. You may have struggled with some yielding to the flesh today or a battle you're fighting. Maybe you just need to come ask God for strength. But we're going to have an invitation in just a moment. You come and you do what God would have you to do. Our Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for the precious word of God. Thank you that we know, we have proof that we serve the living Savior and that the Bible is the living Word of God, and we can practice its principles, and we can, can keep uh, depending upon the precious promises in the Word of God. I pray you'd bless this invitation, and may you receive honor and glory from all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother